<laughs> it was the maestro here. Yeah. Welcome. Well, um, we tried to run, I think, this class last semester, but it, we didn't have a space. So luckily. Yeah, we were going to do the, the people's forum. Yeah, so so I, yeah, people's luckily we got this. <laughs> and it's but much nicer the, than the people's forum. The second attempt. And then nice. some were concerned that maybe it would lose its topical character, but I think, I think that we're safe we're in from it. that. Yeah, we're yeah. safe in that. In terms of uh, topicality, at least. <laughs> um, and obviously, the the impetus for the class came out of the not not only, of course, but the impeachment process and the attempt to eliminate uh, Trump or to fight back against uh, the right through through impeachment, but also before that, a lot of the uh, quote unquote resistance and the kinds of tactics that were being used, and more generally. I mean, I have one of the books I think we'll be using is this collection from uh, Wendy Brown and Jan Janet Haley, Left Legalism, uh, Left Critique. And this is already a good 15 or so years old when it come out, 2000 and something, 2002. So it's 18, 18 years old. So it's not a new phenomenon, obviously. Uh, I think there are some key questions in regards to uh, law and the, f the form law takes in contemporary capitalist societies and the limits this puts on uh, left possibilities, some of which are covered in this volume, some of which, of course, um, uh, go way beyond contemporary developments. Uh, one of which is, and I think it's up to us to we can kind of decide today what direction we want to take the seminar and, and you know, customize the readings and the discussions around that. I think certainly there's one question in terms of what we, the character law takes in what uh, Hannah Arendt, for example, would call the Judeo-Christian notion of law, which is law is about command obey relationships. Law is about domination. And of course, the, she calls it Judeo-Christian because of, it follows from uh, the myth of Moses, you know, as I'm sure everyone knows with the, the 15 commandments, that law is about uh, command. And this is contrasted, of course, with the classical, I, I don't know what term we could use, the classical notion or the non-religious, more political notion of law, which is law as a, uh, 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 the power to create law as a set of uh, practices through which one can produce something, mm -hmm. you know. Law as constitution, as opposed to law as commandment. This is one fundamental, I think, distinction. For us, you know, on the left, it's, it's important. Do, do we mean law? in the sense as a relationship of domination? Or do we understand law as a set of practices through which uh, 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 certain kinds of political uh, uh, creations uh, come about? Again, the, the most, the, one of the famous examples, of course, is Aristotle's The Constitution of the Athenians. You know, what were the, the processes, the procedures through which the Athenians created themselves, right? Law as that process of self-production. The question is, what, what are we producing? What is the self that is being produced? So that's one distinction, right? Law as domination, as commandment. And of course, this has even deeper implications because, in a sense, do we then mean by politics... A set, by politics, do we mean politics as conflict and warfare, or do we mean politics as, uh, uh, as community activity? Is politics the city? As again, you know, the pre-Christian understandings of politics, or the pre-liberal certain understanding of politics. Politics is about deciding how we live together as a group, as a community, how we constitute ourselves as a community, or is it about conflict, competition, domination, 
one group wins, the other group loses, and we give you a command and you obey. You know, is, do we agree with our friend Michel Foucault or, or, and the others that uh, war is politics by other means, or of course vice versa, that politics is war by other means. Any comments on that or caveats, comments? One thing that just came to mind, um, I mean, I, I like the distinction between um, like legal politics as constitution, right, and, and community building versus conflict, but it's just that I think um, it's possible to fold in an agonistic understanding of politics even into the community and constitution yes. building part. So, yes. Yeah. It's possible. And, and then it, oh, it yes, partly sir. depends on what, what we understand by the community and what kind of community sure. we're constituting and you know, what, are, what is the process through which. It doesn't preclude conflict, but it doesn't reduce politics to that moment of domination, mm -hmm. of issuing a command that has to be obeyed. So I think this is one dimension of, let's say, the question of left and the law. Law as command, law as domination, or law as, as a, a process through which creation is. Yeah. It's also the very ancient uh, notion that's taken up by Althusser, which is interpolation. It should really be you know, talked about how we constitute it as subjects. And I think that broaches, or at least is a, is a line or mediation between the two. What is this interpolation? How does it function? You know, and especially how does it function in the law, which to me is the most under theorized domain of all Marxist uh, thinking and theory at this point. There's been very, very little work, except maybe for this intervention by uh, Brown and, uh, you know, and Duncan Kennedy, of course, which is, you know, one of the professors on, yeah. Very little work on interpolation and, and law and uh, yeah. Well, it depends and, how you read it because yeah, well, yeah. Uh, in the psychic well, interpolation life, is yeah, a question yeah, in the of psychic reading. in the psychic life of <laughs> right. power, right, right, which was written by uh, Judith Butler, yes, uh, Wendy Brown's partner. Right, she reads it in that kind of way. Yeah, you know why is it that you know Althusser's examples is are always kind of legalistic? The police officer who says, "Hey, you there," so she. Uh, if I remember well, because it's been right. some years since I've read it, uh, 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 she reads it as a kind of, there's a kind of, the, the mechanism is one of guilt, right? That the kind of legal framework induces a kind of guilt that explains why we are interpolated, why we recognize ourselves as the subject of that utterance. I think it's wrong. And we can discuss that. I think is a wrong reading. Right, but I'm, I'm just using the terms as, in terms of how it functions in the law between both how we constitute, you know, what you're talking about, yes. as a, you know, also as how the subject constitutes oneself. You're pointing to that through psychic power, but at the same time, it becomes this kind of, you know, middle term, if you will, in terms of how you become called, called out, how you become provoked. You know, et cetera. And I think that, you know, someone like Butler is using psychoanalytic categories to, you know, look at it that way, as did Alpha's there, too, you know, bringing yeah. in that. Well, and you, did you feel the guilty in that? Lacan's uh, right. S on the mirror right. stage. Right. Right. Exactly. Important exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, two things that uh, come up from the fall out of my memories. <laughs> <laughs> One is um, it, it, this distinction between the natural law versus man-made law, yes. um, and I think it had something to do with what you described earlier, but in, in essence, I would imagine that this class is going to be all about man-made law. There is no natural law. Okay, fine. So we'll There's just... a tradition of natural law. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but from not, the Marxist but standpoint, from the standpoint, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as, as natural law. Okay, well, I would love to discuss that, but obviously this right. is not the moment. No, this is the no, moment. No, it is the moment, yeah. yeah. Why, why would Marxists... Uh, well, deny? in other words, <laughs> it, you know, it, it, so it, Marx is all about um, science, right? About materialism and science. And um, what's the, you know, what would be the sense of talking about a, a, a scientific materialism if there was not at its uh, fundamental basis natural laws which, which govern the universe. Well, that's something. That there might be 
laws of, of mathematics or physics. Yes, but law in the sense that uh, in terms of uh, politics or you know political rules, there is no such thing. You cannot deduce. There is no objective determination of law outside of uh, uh, society, let's say, or human. human it, it, you know, it's, it's a political question par excellence. And so you're saying within the realm of the human. I mean, well, it, yeah. politics is within the realm yeah. of the human. Yeah. Yeah. You know I'm going to do this, Physics, but I recommend a good book. But go ahead. Yeah. I mean, just, uh, but, you know, you know it's one thing to say, okay, we have the laws right. of gravity or the laws of motion, and we understand them to be external to society. They're not, you know, to use the term, Durkheim's term, social facts, right? These are phenomena in a different register, in a different domain. Politics and culture and society, we take to be self-produced. There was no external that produced it. It's not in the genes. It's mm -hmm. not in so-called nature. There's no God that, that makes it, you know. We know that it's humans who make. When Moses comes down with the 15 commandments, we know from our standpoint. Gave him five extra, huh? One fell. Yeah, 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 one yeah, fell yeah, from, yeah, 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 yeah this is yeah, like this. Yeah, yeah. 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 a little known <laughs> fact. Oh, it's I have a moral no. mark for you. I know that. that. Huh? Mel Brooks. Second coming. We know there are human creations. You know? The question becomes, does that society recognize it right. as their creation, or they think, they pretend, whatever, you know, the noble lives so are from play God, God, that it comes from somewhere, somewhere else. Yeah. Because yeah. That, yeah. Makes, that makes people more likely to obey. We, we live in New York City, so one person's garbage is another person's art. You know, like one person's, I worked with homeless advocates, and you know, you, you get arrested, you litigate, you go to court, you create a right to shelter, you create a right to people having, you know, space to get housed within a day for HIV, AIDS services, etc. Those are direct action based legal solutions, but my dad would always say, you know, like, you guys are organizing for somebody to have the civil rights to throw turds at me. Like, he's a lawyer, but he's like, so for the legal arguments that we were making for the right to shelter, anybody else can say that's violence. I could say that's community building. It's creating a space in the city for different kinds of people, you know, but somebody else is going to say, so, I mean, which is violence? You know, I, like, you, you, we, we've, we've got this conflict, this constant clash. Between violence or community building, I mean the the. Well, that's another. Get, I mean, you know, we have. Well, that's, that's another the issue that Bloomberg brought up about uh, Occupy Wall Street to take away Zuccotti Park. Right. Well, legally, there was, exactly no, there was no legal. Which you're just there's no legal about. standing to get rid of yeah. a privately owned public space to get rid yeah. of people's access to that space. I mean that so. Uh, yeah. 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 The other it's thing takes place that, over and over again. Yeah. The other thing that came up out of the fog was uh, I can't remember the exact wording anymore, but in Blackstone who codified the common laws in England, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, had this uh, definition of law. You're not that foggy, if you could remember him. <laughs> you know, vaguely, right? Well, I was, you know, schooled in this, but, yeah. you know, I okay. uh, forget a lot of it. But um, and, uh, basically, uh, I'm paraphrasing now, but the gist of it was the superior declares something with which the inferior is bound to obey. That was, right. you know, paraphrasing, to, but to get the point, that the law, and that's a new, now we're talking about Command human law. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, it's it, all human law. But yeah. again, the idea, the notion the idea that, is that, that there is a natural law. Somebody declares, you know, human law is simply the, the, the superior declares it and the inferior is bound to obey it. That's right. human law. Well, it's that's, all that's human law. That's a particular notion of human, human law, law hmm? I think. Pardon? I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with what you're saying, but... And, and Marx, I think, would surely say that, that law is a social institution of humans and, yeah, you know, it's the what, function of yeah, our relation to production. That's what was saying, in effect. Yeah. Sure, but, but I do think, like, there's, like, one thing that is just that Marx kind of had a blind spot because he didn't conceive of other cultural formations. And so, you know, like, Indigenous Australians or Indigenous peoples in different parts of the world had, you know, I'm not saying it's not human law, right. but there's, like, a different thing going on where law and nature are maybe perhaps less divided than... Mm -hmm. um, in, mm -hmm. you know, Western social formation. But it's not right. the nature that produces that. No, it's, it's not it's the nature, the but, that but nonetheless, the you know, we we'll probably bench. have a reaction yeah. Black to Black Elk that. Speaks is very different than Blackstone speaking. Right? Yes. Yeah, but, I mean, the notion of, of natural law uh, 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 is so as to put a limit on the political possibilities. Mm -hmm. You know, when the, when the liberal tradition says, you know, there is a natural right 
to life, liberty, and property. It is a, 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 in effect an attempt to limit politics to exclude, you know, so as no political formation could violate those so-called rights. So because it's saying it's not us that create those rules. Again, it's the same problem. So from a Marxist point of view, um, it makes, uh, would, a Marxist would never say human nature. It was human nature. Anyone, not only the Marxists, anyone from, <laughs> the, the, standpoint, from the standpoint of social science takes the position, it's not Marx, it's Durkheim even, or Max Weber, anyone you want, you know, that social phenomenon are created by social causes. That law is produced or created by human societies. It doesn't come from the out. There's no outside for it to come from. Is, is it axiomatic principle? Now, again, we can distinguish between societies that recognize that truth and those that consciously or by, you know, or pretending, pretend that it comes from somewhere else. Did Grotius know better? Probably, you know, did, uh, you know, Hobbes know better? I think so, but that it takes that form of argumentation about natural law and so forth is in order to make their argument more compelling to say, no matter what you may think the good and bad is, you can not transgress on these natural laws, this God-given, whatever you want, whatever term you want to use. We know there's no God. We know that it's our creation to put these things in that way. And that, it, that you have that moment of uh, the noble lie, again, as Plato says, or, you know, in, uh, uh, when uh, Third book Dostoevsky says, probably. you know, God is dead and everything is possible and so forth. That, of course, is the meaning, right? If people know that it's not some, let's say, law of nature or law of God to do it, now everything is possible. Which is, of course... He what, said permitted. Permitted, Not yes. possible. Well, yeah, there was a kind yes. of, yeah. So this is the, the, the problem. Yeah. So, of course, it's not only the Marxists. Any social scientific tradition... Uh, would uh, reject this notion of natural law. Maybe if you study theology, it's something else. You know, you go to school of theology, they can tell you all these things. Or the legal tradition, which is, of course, very much tied up with these other mythologies and myths. But from the social scientific standpoint, there is no such thing. There is such a thing in terms of humans created a notion of natural law. But there's no such thing as some kind of natural objective rules that pre-exist. But if there's this idea of the commons, then that, I think, you know, to me, that's it's the question is, is there a legal framework for the pub, for a public sphere? Or is the public sphere, I mean, it, it's, it's eroded every day, you know, and, and it expands. Well, this is contracts. another, we'll get to that. This is another right. one. We'll go back to Marks on the Jewish question on this notion of public and private right. and how it's tied to law. But I think so we have one distinction that we could spend a lot of time or not spend a lot of time on, which is law as command obey versus uh, uh, law as recipe or mm -hmm. you know, process, let's say, through which things are, uh, uh, society is able to constitute itself. Then we have I would say another distinction, which is, uh, which is, carries off what we just said, which is constituent versus constituted power. You know, the question of law as constituted power as opposed to constituent power, which I think has a lot of relevance on a lot of the contemporary goings on. Mm -hmm. Because we see that many of the arguments are, let's say, against constituent power, against, let's say, the power of voters to decide something and say, no, 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 we have to be obedient to the constituted powers. If George Washington and <laughs> Thomas Jefferson 200-some years ago said this, we are bound to obey, and if you don't obey, you, you know, we should be put in jail, or you should be impeached or whatever because we are bound to obey the 
whatever the presumed laws are in the Constitution or the, yes? Stupid question, but did Negri come up with that? Or no. That no. no, Negri has a very good discussion right. of that. That's the discussion. Oh, that yes. was the which only place really I've a, ever read. Which is really a great, uh, great book in terms of all of this and translated as in insurgencies, right? And uh, well, that's you know, one of the, the whole question of natural law following. tradition is in the opening of that book vis-a-vis -vis Hobbes and um, you know all the yes. ways and Machiavelli's distinction and, and, and use of virtu and fortuna, uh, very very you know very advanced thinking on this notion of what the difference is between constituent and constituted power. So for me, like in the sense of political practice, I mean I think uh, the reference to Tanegri is you know definitely right on point. Because apart from looking at the distinction between constituent and constituted power within the context of existing institutions, and therefore even constituent power as one necessarily targeting or aiming at creating kind of new state institutions, so to speak, I think it's also important to look at like what Negri, I think, refers to as the making prince of the multitude, right? Which is the, the processes by which we learn the art of self-rule, going back to, to what yeah. we were talking about earlier, right. and creating new norms and institutions, I think both within leftist movements and between them, more importantly. Exactly, yeah. So now, I mean, we have now the, the strange phenomenon that it's not only Bernie Sanders or, you know, others who extol the <laughs> virtues of the Constitution, the FBI, you know, Department of Justice, <laughs> whatever, but even people who are presumed to be on the left, you know, from the DSA mm -hmm. onwards, that now speaks this language of... A kinder and you more gentle be, imperialism. Not only that, that's <laughs> right, another that's matter, but <laughs> that you have to be faithful to the law and the Constitution, you know, this is illegal, you know, Trump is a criminal, right. should be put in jail. And by default, of course, not work, not, not focusing on, on the constituent side of things. You know, in a way, it's a kind of attempt mm -hmm. at a shortcut or a cheat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. You know, yeah. that you don't have the... the, the uh, uh, broader uh, 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 popular backing, so you attempt to use law to shut off certain political doorways. I mean, a couple of, about 10 years ago, there was a volume that David Graver, Graver and Stephen Chikaikis that I contributed, a lot of people contributed, called The Constituent Imagination. It was all about global justice movement and the idea of multitude practices, but the all power to the imagination does sometimes hit a wall. And I think that's what a little bit of the book is all about. It's just like these ideas that get out there and you create movement practices around them, but then they, then they recede after a while in time. And I think that's, that's the challenge. I mean, with, you know, then you're stuck with the Constitution because you've got this constituent imagination that's you're out there running and you're burning and you're burning, but... Well, you can't only have, have constituent power. Yeah. The constituted moment is yeah. necessary, right. it's unavoidable, yeah. but yeah. whose constituted moment? Yeah. You know, right. do you become de facto uh, supporters of, uh, of George Washington and this very anti-democratic, you know, very limiting f form of uh, uh, government that exists in the United States? Or do you create something new? So, it seems that much of not only the, and, and of course there are also the tactical dilemmas, because obviously the attempt to impeach Trump failed, is a failure, you know, he, I mean in the sense that he was not thrown out of office, obviously. Well, his popularity and, is now highest yes. than ever. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly what we uh, sort of predicted by the Exactly. Process. Yeah. So, you know, there's a practical political uh, 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 dimension to the problems too because on the one hand it's not just okay you are in effect tying yourself to this very oppressive uh, legal order that exists in the United States you are moving backwards in terms of achieving your immediate practical political aims which is getting rid of Trump let's say right presumably that's the goal to get rid of Trump He's still there, more popular than ever, and now you've used all this time and all these resources talking about what constitutes corruption, you know, 
Is, was the phone call a perfect phone call? It was not. An, it was an imperfect phone call. You know, he was a it's quid pro quo. It's not quid pro quo. And you have the tax reforms, the Trump tax reforms, which are, you know, not for a Jesus. disaster for many people, going more or less un, undiscussed. You have, you know, the broader and deeper political problems. You know, and if Trump won by appealing to a certain anxiety and economic uncertainty among certain segments of uh, 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 the subaltern classes or the dominated classes, whatever term we want to use, the Democrats have not really addressed that issue as much as they say, you know, Trump is not a nice person. He's greedy. He's... So, I'm not, you know, I'm just offering this for, for conversation, but, yeah. you know, I, just, I mean, I think all politics is a lot of it's just theater. But from the point of view of theater, the fact that uh, the Democrats knew before this whole thing started that they didn't have a chance, that the, right. that the you know, the, the, the Senate was going to vote the way they did. They, and, and so they said they did it for two reasons. One, they said, we just have to make the point. We couldn't just, you know, stand by and let these laws be broken and not, you know, raise our voice. Number two, we know that the Republicans are going to, uh, you know, vote in lockstep. And it'll be useful, you know, in the future that the public will see, you know, what, what, what a sham, you know, this whole, you know, supposedly democratic system is. And we'll question, you know, so just in terms of, you know, if you're playing the long, the long game, you know, you're going to lose the battle. You know you're going to lose the battle, but it might help the war. What, what do you think of that? Just... I'm very skeptical because, they, uh, f first of all, we have, there used to be a notion, and if you read Weber's Politics as a Vocation, and many, and not just that, that's maybe the most obvious example, there was an idea that this society produces different kinds of people. There's not just one kind of person produced in society. And the kind of person that's appropriate for political life is very particular. It's not the common type of person. It's not someone who is motivated by self-interests. It's not someone who's motivated for personal aggrandizement. These people are not appropriate for political life. The, those ideas have long vanished, I believe. And if you look at the dominant, if you look at a discipline like political science, for example, and you see how the, how, what is the dominant analytical model for analyzing the, beha the behavior of politicians? It's rational choice theory. So you have now, I think, the assumption that the motivation that the kind of person appropriate for politics is the same as the kind of person appropriate for business. And if you have a business person, all the better. Even a more excellent fit with the requisites of elected office. And they are motivated out of self-interest. So if you say, you know, Trump is fundamentally motivated out of self-interest, that's nothing people already know and accept in a certain level. And they say, well, everyone is motivated by self-interest. You know, Obama was president, and now he is a multi-multi-millionaire making all this money because he was president. And of course, this is true. Now, can we say that was the main motivation or not? It doesn't matter. You know, that's, that's the, the assumption. And you could say, look, Trump is not motivated out of self-interest. Yeah. He's lost $400 million as yeah. president. But it also seems, I mean, that there was a major shift in what you were saying in terms of the history of American, uh, the presidency, up until Bill Clinton, the model still was you were doing public service, even though you had families like the Kennedys and the Bushes, they still had that notion. Right. Whereas the Clintons, you know, Clinton basically changed the model very much. Well, it so, may, it may of be, which Blair was an example. It may Europe, be a phenomenon. Like, you know, Berlusconi and Trump become that goes other well kinds beyond. Of models, right? Yeah. I think it yeah. goes well beyond Clinton. Yeah, yeah, no, you know, I know. I'm just, the, no, no, I know that, but I'm just saying that th this is now an accepted thing. Yes. Someone runs for president for their self, right. you know, interest, et cetera. Uh, you wouldn't say that about Eisenhower. You wouldn't say that about the Kennedys, even though we know the class relations and the, you know, the, right. you know, the. But the, I mean, the more notion. to the point, yeah, yeah. people don't no longer see it as a negative. 
They take right. it as exactly. being a universal truth, of course. Yes. So so when, you, when, you say, when you say the left still is buying into the myth of the civil servant, you know, as the politician... Is Not the left. No, the American same. society in general. Right. Right. Contemporary society in no, general. No, 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 but you're just saying contemporary society in general accepts the, uh, you know, is sort of uh, cynical. We understand, you know, politicians are in it for themselves. Right. But the left is aware of that, but when it argues, it argues from, from the platonic ideal of the guardian that, no, the, the, the civil servant is somebody special, it's somebody who's trained to look out for the common good. I mean, and they, they're constantly arguing. Ultimately, if you boil down all the left arguments, they're arguing that, uh, that, that that's what they, they, they truly believe in their hearts, that uh, if we really had the right civil servants they would be representing the people and the common good. So there is I this. Think even there is this. Tendency. Not much less than this. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> well, which well, left are you talking about? Yeah, I just so clarified. There's only one of the people in this room. <laughs> well, you know, it depends yeah. on your level of cynicism. I know, I know this one has. We're on the spectrum. First of all, we're at least in some people in this room. Not the radical room, left. Believe the there, radical there, radical is, uh, there are leftists, but there is no left. And that's point. the thing, right? Because yeah, I think you're talking about well, well, at that point, there's, no, there's no point maybe. in playing the political game at all. No, I don't think this thing. is true because even <laughs> someone like. Uh, no, the key for the bathroom is on the counter, right there to your right. Sorry, and, uh, I'm not arguing yeah. against anything, I'm just opening no, I don't think what you say is what people, these people actually believe because, for example, if what you say is true and it was simply about the person, then someone like Bernie Sanders. Why should you limit who you take campaign contributions from? Why not take money from the big millionaires and billionaires? If it's all about you, then the, money, the people who give you money are inconsequential. No, what I'm saying is the Bernie people uh, buy into the older uh, uh, idea. The, the no, I'm, I'm, I'm saying maybe not, because if that were true, then they wouldn't focus on who gives money to whom. Because it would be material. No, and I think it would. Their thinking would be just the opposite, and because they believe that the civil surgeon servant should be representing the common good, then it would go against their thinking that uh, they should be basically bought out by, by a privileged sector of society. That that totally goes against their um, their, their mythology of what a civil servant but should it, be. But if it were a matter of of personal integrity. In constitution, right. then the who gave money to your campaign would be a non-issue, because even if someone gave you a lot of money, you wouldn't be swayed by that. You would still uphold the same principles. Well, you know, so the, the, obviously <laughs> they think it's something beyond individual personality and integrity, they're, they're, because they say we're not going to accept the money, because if we accept the money, it might bias our judgment. You know, there's a famous uh, politician, I remember 100 years ago, I forget his name, but he said there was like two things that are important in politics. One is money. Right. And I forgot the other one. <laughs> yeah. It's all about, you know, money is power, power is politics, and, um, you know, for the idealistic, you know, the, the Bernie sector on the spectrum, you know, you know, from right to left, the Bernie sector, for whatever fantasy world you think they might be living in, believe in that, you know, money corrupts and, uh, and that uh, Bernie is representing something who's fighting against that idea by simply going to get the little people to give them the $2 and the $27. And, you know, it's, 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 a, um, it's a, almost like a, a religious belief with them that, you know, if, if Buttigieg has 40 billionaires that are basically funding him, then that sector of society cannot accept uh, a Buddha geek. I feel like I can maybe tie this back even to the discussion about impeachment a little more as at least one example of um, 
judicialized politics um, in the sense that, like, I think what really matters, again, like from the perspective of political actors on the left is that, yes, I mean, these are judicially and constitutionally guaranteed modes of pursuing politics, but at the same time, it doesn't need to be um, pursued in a wholly legalistic fashion. Um, for instance, uh, in Korea, which is where I am from, the current president was um, actually the result of the impeachment of the prior, pre you know, president, mm -hmm. um, you know, who was the daughter of um, an erstwhile, um, you know, military dictator, mm -hmm. and that impeachment process was the result of mass mobilization on the part of the entire country. I mean, we now know from the example of like places like Brazil that impeachment politics doesn't always go in that direction, mm -hmm. but I do think there can be mass mobilization, and that's why I think you were referring to some of the the kind of more people empowering aspects of the Bernie campaign. Yeah. Um, like, you know, I'm not a Bernie bro, um, and I actually left the DSA because of its electoral politics and like it, its emphasis there. But I do think there are qualitative differences. Um, and on that level, I think talking about judicial politics isn't just a matter of tactics, it's also a matter of political strategy. And because, I mean, he left, because one other thing that I was thinking about was that when I was thinking of um, like law as power building and, you know, uh, like, you know, on the part of political communities, that almost seems like political activity that runs parallel to existing state institutions. It's like the left is like, you know, we're creating more organizations and we're trying to organize and that may exist like kind of just alongside the existing systems, but we also have to like think about how to interject um, into the existing systems. And so I think there, um, the matter of judicial politics also becomes um, or can be thought of as like the question of like reform, non-reformist reforms, revolution, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. no that, that's certainly yeah. one, of the, one yeah. of the issues. But again, the question is whether the, the, the contemporary uh, and we're hoping for an Academy Award for a parasite. But anyway, <laughs> right. the, the institutional uh, 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 form that law takes today and how it impacts all these different possibilities. And so I think, again, one is this constituent versus constituent, and then how, in effect, people, you know, the, the, the movements of the nominal left are put in a position to identify with mm -hmm. the constituted power to function in what is a fundamentally anti-democratic way, saying we want ever more limitations. We agree with the limitations put on constituent power. We would like more of them, actually. Yeah. You know, whatever form that means. Well, that means we're going to outlaw certain forms of speech. We're going to outlaw certain kinds of political movements. Whatever, what, as good as that may be in the short run, you know, what we are doing is adding more and more and more mm -hmm. weight to, cons to the constituted power mm -hmm. and taking away from the range of possibilities to constituent right. power. Like, I don't want to, um, like, interject too much, but I guess that's the parallelism that I was talking about, because that leads me to believe that constituent power can't engage with constituted power. And, like, that's the strategic question. Then, is it just a kind of, like, parallel political activity um, right. until, the, you know, we amass enough power in order to overthrow everything. So meaning, yeah. can there be forms of constituent power that interacts with the constituted power? And what might that look like? I mean, one thing we haven't talked about, for instance, and I, I thought we would from the beginning, is a kind of co-evil and co-constitutive relationship between law and property, right? Mm -hmm. And so on, on that level, I'm, I'm just thinking about different cooperative um, you know, practices. Um, and even when it comes to housing, um, well, like what kind of new legal frameworks might we need in order to escape, um, like in a sense, like the, the the law today that guarantees property, you know, for for uh, you know the capitalists, right. but can that just be again this parallel activity, or do we engage with the system? Yeah, I mean, for example, I mean, if I could make a, a concrete uh, example here. Um, Hakeem Jeffries, who was part of the managers of the Democratic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, um, House people in impeachment, you know, came up with a proposal to be put into law that during the financial crisis, anybody that had been pushed out of their homes mm -hmm. would be given free access to high-rise uh, apartments that were unoccupied. 
So that, I mean, that may be one example through housing of how one would work. I think what mm -hmm. you're what you're saying, you know, between the law. But the problem is, is that the law right now, what we have on so many levels, is so stacked, uh -huh. right? I mean. Where do you begin? You mm -hmm. know, where where are those even loopholes at this point? I mean, you know, because this is, I think, the problem with having a Trump in the White House, or you know, earlier before that, the Bushes, etc. The the Republican Party has stacked, you know, local governments, and you know, everybody says work in the community or work locally. Where are you going to find? those, quote, judiciary, you know, uh, moments in order of, of being a co-evil uh -huh. or a co, you but know, also, I uh, think a like, structural mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, yeah, I think, I think yeah. when there's two things that come yeah. to mind from, from what you're saying that, like, one is just, I think, a question around whether there can be actual parallelism, as I think right. she used right. the term that you use, right. like whether that actually is possible or whether the totalizing effect of our legal system is such like, that you kind of can't, you might think that's what you're doing, but in right. actual fact, right. you're sort of enmeshed. In, in what's going on and possibly further entrenching yourself without necessarily realizing it. Um, so I, I, you know, I think that's like for me, like one sort mm -hmm. of ongoing question. And then the other question is just like almost like a strategic question of, you know, like things like um, you know, land community land trusts or cooperative models or whatever. Right. Like the question is really like, you can kind of carve out like some more humane version of whatever right. it is you think the world is in a small corner of it and do mm -hmm. that thing. And that might be fine for the people that are involved in that and doing the thing or the people who get the right. apartments mm -hmm. or whatever, right. but right. how that leads, like how that is a step towards actually right. dismantling yeah. kind of what we have in you know, a big Like our staff. good friend John Clark has a land trust in Mississippi and it's a co-op, yeah. free education, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, group mm -hmm. of young anarchists. That's right. Like that I'm not saying it's not right. Great, right, no, no, no. But I don't understand. But I hear what you're right. saying. And yeah. I'm, I'm in, but, I like the way you frame this between parallelism and a kind of totalizing notion mm -hmm. of where the, the law may be used in terms of, you know, I think we're looking at the use value here of law. Uh -huh. you know, I mean, I mean, and it's a question. Yeah, I'm not yeah, like saying yeah, I didn't yeah, certainly yeah, like yeah. have a particular form of uh -huh. view about it. I mean, no, so. this is, I mean, I I exactly the, the question that I had in mind too. Although I feel like there is a need to draw a distinction between, on the one hand, a more classically welfareist approach to, to housing, as in mm -hmm. like, you know, these giveaways, mm -hmm. versus something more like the community land trust, which is, you know, what, what, I, what I had in mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, which allows for people, I think, to come together and to create, like, political communities. And then, of course, like, the all-important question there would be, well, is that just going to be a mode of politics open to small groups of people? How is that going to change the society at large? And I think that's why, well, might it be possible to, I mean... I I think it was called Moms for Housing in Oakland okay. recently. Yeah, it was right. A successful and, moment. Right, yeah. like yeah. I mean, one successful moment. But like, mm -hmm. what if those initiatives were to become more replicated? Mm -hmm. Because I'm really thinking about where is like the political opening for the left today? Like, what are we going to do if it just isn't like this wholesale right. devotion to electoral politics? Mm -hmm. And I think if we do that, and I think that's why confederal forms of democracy yes. is is really key. It's not about having pockets here and there, but connecting these. Um, enterprise, uh, that's capitalist, connecting these uh, initiatives. Moms for Housing yeah. in Oakland, that was interesting, right. I think, <laughs> when they were interviewed. Although like, Star Trek you know, was, was our enterprise, <laughs> and it was written by a communist uh, the early, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it was a victory mm -hmm. um, in a certain sense, but one of the things that they were interrogating was how they came, like, how they went from... Um, being criminalized mm -hmm. um, and facing the brunt of like state violence mm -hmm. to then having political actors intervene like elected politicians mm -hmm. capitalist politicians intervene on their behalf mm -hmm. to broker this deal mm -hmm. to get them this you know into this community land trust program and they themselves were questioning we don't trust this mm -hmm. like this is not we didn't broker this deal mm -hmm. nobody came to us and we didn't sit at a table and like mm -hmm. you know there was like a how it happened the yeah. means by which it happened um, that was sort of made, undid the mm -hmm. victory in a certain sense because mm -hmm. it kind of was actually disempowering. It was not power building like that. You know, yeah. it was kind of interesting. I, I think we can make a distinction in terms of, of in terms of the consti constituted power if it's furthering its anti democratic character in terms of limits being placed mm -hmm. on things. Because again, what's the whole point of this? That they put f limits on the possibilities. You know, through process and also through direct command, thou shalt not violate property rights or whatever, you know, and do all these things. So, is one thing, for example, to say, well, we want limitations against 
uh, hate speech. You know, so th and now you have a situation where you're bringing in the state to regulate the political speech of, you know, so-called civil society as opposed to something like the land trust or like right. our friend Mike, Mike Mentor does right. with uh, uh, participatory right. budgeting right. and so right. forth, right. Yeah. which is, mm -hmm. you, you, of course, you're interacting right. with constituted right. power, right. but not to bring it in a stronger way as a regulator, let's right. say, or dominator, but as to create more spaces for participation and activity. So I think at a minimum there are two, mm -hmm. there are those two possibilities that we could sketch out and then say, well, this is a, a, a revolutionary reform or has potentialities as opposed to a reform that does not really have any broader capacity because it's all about maintaining that, that uh, coercive power of the state. So if I could put what you raised in, in a little historical, fairly recent historical context, the last hundred years, there's a, there's a book that just recently came out by a law professor at Columbia by the name of um, Catherine P. Stark, That's a good book. Yeah, yeah. And, and the book is called The Code of Capital, How the Law Creates Wealth and Inequality. And there was a, a review of the book by Adam Tooze in uh, this month's New York Review. I'm just going to read the first two yeah. sentences just to get give you a, a sense of, of, of the <laughs> It's a good point. review, by the way. I've read it. Yeah. it just yeah, to give you a sense of, of, of the, you know, these quote, a, it starts out with this quote. Uh, there is an estate in the realm more powerful than either your lordship or other houses of parliament. One Lord Campbell proclaimed to the peers of the House of Lords in 1851. And that is the county solicitors. It was the lawyers, and that end of quote. It was the, and then it's uh, Adam Tews speaking here, and it says, it was the lawyers, in other words, who kept England's landed elite so, so very well elite, who shielded and extended the wealth of the landowners, even granting them legal protection against their own creditors. So this, this tradition of the law, you know, as enforcing the exploitive classes, I mean, this is a hundred and some odd years ago, but, you know, you can go probably all the way back in history and find, yeah, I mean, find the same phenomena. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's, it's almost, you know, a pattern uh, that reproduces this all the time. Those in power use the law, right? Or write the law. They, they, write, write, yeah, they, they write the law. They write They're it. writing it. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's the issue. Exactly. Writing and rewriting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Underwriting, writing, rewriting, and revising, then, yeah. everything. You know. And then, yeah, yeah, and just in yeah. case, you know, they yeah. mess up, they make sure, like today, right. that they get all the judges into the court. So, you know, not only yes. do they write them, but they have the people right. who are going to interpret what they've right. written. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, you know, so yeah. I mean, this I mean, this is the current state, you know, yeah, of you sure. know, like banging our heads against the wall and thinking, you know, somehow if we keep doing it enough times, you know, it's going to somehow the wall's going to come down. Yeah. Well, that's like you know Walter Benjamin's uh, idea that there is only two kinds of violence: violence in the maintaining of the existing laws, and of course, violence in changing uh, the laws. And we know that, of course, you know, from the standpoint of history, the dominant classes are always, of course, at an advantage when it comes to... I don't know, that community. type of distinction always makes me feel like, um, like it becomes a, like black and white, kind of like, you know, taking like law can only really be an instrument, um, you know, uh, yes. of, of domination. I mean, because like, you know, to take that a step further into the present, um, I mean, I... I don't think neoliberalism, by the way, like, you know, works by way of leaving market forces um, alone. I think, you know, that's also like a matter of creating the legal infrastructure, um, yes. you know, whereby, yeah, sure. right, like, you know, sure. um, the, the economy yeah. works for sure. Um, I mean, but like speaking of twos and his account of like, the 2008, right. um, you know, right. Right. Uh, crisis in, in crashed, I mean, now we're looking at these international monetary institutions, right, um, that are not regulated. And I feel like on the left, we don't talk about that a, a whole lot. Um, and so in order to then, in a sense, like to bring those vectors of, um, you know, financial quantitative easing and, you know, like, you know, whatnot into control, and I do think that is an urgent task, um, you know, today, 
I mean, could we afford not to use yeah. um, the I mean, going, constraints? Yeah, going back 20 years, I mean, uh -huh. this is exactly the completely missed point of Negra and Hart's empire. They said, you want to study, study the international law firms and their role mm -hmm. in the creation mm -hmm. of this empire. And this has not been taken up. Everything else in that book is taken up or criticized, but none of this has really been, been, been happening. And even Gilles Deleuze said the most under-theorized, the most under-talked about thing in philosophy is the relationship of law to yeah. philosophy. So this is this is always this has really been something that again that uh, you know a course like this or something this kind of thinking should be the beginning yeah, of I mean, a, just, an approach it, both to what you're saying. How do we understand this? That you know some fourth removed person owns you know part of the mortgage to some of us in here's properties right living in China who has no idea where the United States is mm -hmm. through a complex set of derivatives. Right, of which is on a floating crap game, but is still working because it is regulated by laws, you know, that are put into effect by law law firm, and you know, and how does this go? I mean, you know, I mean, this this is the beginning, at least in my mind, of an, an, a beginning of an understanding of inflation. You know, there's never been a good Marxist account of why is it an apartment in New York City was three hundred and fifty dollars, you know, twenty five years ago is now over three thousand. Well, right? Where does this come from? Well, I mean, you know. Free of capital. Yeah, well, yes, yes and no. Yes and no. But he never really went further to, to explain inflation, how it really works, in, in a sense, right? Vis-a-vis yeah. -vis the law and stuff. Yeah, well, it's not the, about, the, in, in this case, it's not about inflation. Capital, it's about, it's uh, about, it's about, it's about right, 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 it's about, you know, the uh, uh, rent-seeking through, through uh, monopoly. Right. It's not yes, inflation. Uh, of, of course. Yeah, I, mean, I know the concept, but how does it go? The concept was there before that, but you didn't have that kind of massive uh, inflation in the 1950s or in the 1930s, and you know, etc. Well, yeah, you didn't. Well, Michael no, you never Hart talks yeah. about yeah, yeah. the phenomenon of right. gentrification, increasing property values, as being like the commodification of social relations, in that those neighborhoods where the uh, community culture has arisen that people now want, it becomes commodified. It literally can get turned into rent. Yeah. Norbert Elias in the civilizing process, he uh, 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 argues that the decline of the landed class was precisely because of inflation. Because of the increased use of money. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about this massive inflation. We're talking about thousand percent in the last twenty to twenty-five years for, in terms of rent and housing. We're not talking inflation a hundred, two hundred percent. We're talking multiple, multiple levels here. We're talking about the creation of of a new new types of financial instruments which have created trillions of dollars unaccounted for that still yeah. go into the system. Yeah. That we are not be even beginning to understand how that works and how the law is actually keeping that yeah. somewhat yeah. regulated. That's all I'm pointing yeah. to. I'm not denying that Marx wrote in volume three of Capital <laughs> or Elias did. You know, I know this stuff yeah. I know. I'm just talking about where we are today, how this has been pulled off. You know, how does this continue in a sense? Why do we feel, you know, in a certain way so impotent, you know, against it? How, how, did, how has this being become, uh, you know, created this? Yeah, well, that, yeah. You know, what I hope yeah. the, the yeah. class yeah. would yeah. get into. I'm not into. saying we don't find the answers, but, you know, but at least, at least, yeah, I like that. No, good, 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 yeah, I speak like a philosopher, I understand, right? and you, you speak like the militant, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, yeah. I would hope for is that the, the class would really, and solidify the connection between the exploitation of the landlords and the bankers and the, in general the rentier class, right. how that all is connected and made possible through the legal system, through the laws. In other words, everything they do is legal. Right. What the bankers do by creating money, what yeah. the real estate people do by charging for, you know, for the commons, these things have been uh, legal. They, they, they have legally commodified public trust, they have legally commodified the commons through the law system, right? right? And therefore, you know, to challenge the exploitation... What, what's, what's the dilemma of that? I don't understand why that's... 
Well, no, What's I'm just thinking that if this course, this course is about honing in on law and it's sort of ram how the law ramifies uh, and vibrates through society, right? Then, then we have to really see in the institutions, a law being an institution, but the other institutions, how uh, powerful the law is and that, you know, if, if the laws, for example, are not changed, then nothing is, you know, of substance is, is going to be changed, you know. I the, think you know. one distinction there would be between law as exercise, like an, as, as an exercise of autonomia, right, so through democratic practices, and like, you know, speaking of, um, you know, financialization uh, based in inflation, I think there, um, it, it I mean, we could say it happens through law in the sense that it's legal, but that's where the, the technocracy, like the, you know, the, the, the monetarist like technocracy comes in. And that has very little to do with democratic control or, or input. I mean, for instance, like the Federal Reserve, right? And almost you know, none. Almost none. none. And, you know, it's like, what were the, like the, um, the, the bank security that like the Fed gave to the, the, the ECB, the European Central Bank during the time of the crisis. And right. And they're like going around talking about it. It's like, oh, I pulled off this heroic move and I saved the system. But I mean, but it's like, well, that's law in the nominal sense. But so then is there like, you know, room to think about democratic constraint and bringing it back into the, the political arena whereby like you know we as right. um, you know as, as the people can take control yeah of I mean now I mean, the way the law I mean, a lot of the way the law, the law works is to say you can do you know you can do things so if New York City wants to pass mm -hmm. some rule or law saying that we're going to uh, if uh, increase uh, property taxes even so that you can do it no, there's a limitation. It has to be through Albany. And if Albany wants to do that, if, if, if I want to run for mayor and say, look, you know, we live, the, 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 the housing question is the most fundamental question in New York City. We're going to just shuffle the deck. We're, you know, we're going to shuffle the deck and redistribute property. You know, every resident will get a property. We'll just put everything out of a hat and have a lottery and, you know, you'll get an apartment somewhere in the city. They will not allow us to do that, obviously. We just can't say what's our city. We, you know, it's... We. Right. So... Right. Not within the confines of the law. No. Yeah, so, no. yeah, so, so, yeah. so don't buy into the democracy thing, right? In other words, is what you're saying. No, no, that but the thing that you democracy. Say. There, There's no question there's no democracy, right. but the question <laughs> is, you know, given the existing legal uh, uh, structures, right. how the left, you know, what are the pitfalls? How we, what can we do in order to avoid some of these traps? Or what are some of the lim limitations that are presented to us that maybe people are not, you know, when you talk about something like yeah, the impeachment or the resistance, yeah. people don't recognize immediately, but in effect they are, yeah. you know, they, they are doomed to failure or even worse. And, and you, Beth, and myself know very well in academic unions that nobody's going to take the risk of breaking the law. You know, that's another thing. I must. This is a, a form of constituted, you know, uh, no, but even power. Way. You know, the Taylor Law and CUNY. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody thinks about let's let's go out and uh, you know break, uh, mm -hmm. go on strike, threaten this at the, at the, at the table. In well, a way, the transit workers. Yes, and the transit workers. Look ago. what happened to them. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And you see what happens that very few people at LIU when we're locked out. I'm the only person who say walk past the security guards. They're all students of ours. And go occupy the campus. Right. Nobody's going to do it. Can I yeah, just, we're, we're locked out. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so. Oh no, no. I was just going to go back to yeah. what, what you were saying. One thing that I have sort of come to be thinking about a little bit recently that relates um, is that you know just this question around even though all the exploitation, the commodification, the you know the closures, the primitive accumulation, right. all right. of that right. was done legally, so to speak. Yes. They still act extra legally all the time. Like they still have to lie, cheat. You know what I mean? And, and like what creates that sort of, hmm. in spite of the fact that the law is entirely on their side, why do we have this dynamic where they're still yeah. acting in ways that function outside the law and kind of calling on the I mean, law to do more for them than it currently already does, even though it does everything? I was astonished to learn that a, a very wealthy family, when I went to a funeral in New Orleans, has a hundred shell companies. 
Yes. But they don't do it. But they yes. created and the it. The subprime mortgage crisis, the Abbott Bank anyway, getting sued of the only one. I was pulled aside and said, well, when oh, I, there are 100 shell companies yeah. that are there. When I was looking a little bit right, at the right, study right. of law, I was told that there's a, a fundamental difference between continental law in Europe and English common law. And the oversimplified says uh, continental law is basically what the king says is law. That's it. And, you know, and in uh, the common law, in theory, right, it says no man is above the law. Very different philosophy, right? In other words, the but law... The king is. Yeah, but, but <laughs> in, it, you know, nominally, in word, you know, the English common law is no man is above the law. But in fact, in practice, we have the continental law, where the, what the king says, what the masters of the universe say, becomes the law, right? Well. You As Carl Schmidt says, there's always the state of exception. That's in every, you know, in every legal formation. You know, what that is might not be the same, but that there is right. a moment where the law can be suspended is well, uh, always, just, a, always just, true. Just, try, just trying to break through the myth. For example, there's a, there's a myth of a free market. There's no such thing as a free market. Markets only work that because there are laws. That's the most right? freedom of right? all. Right? <laughs> right? So it's the same thing with believing, you know, so what, what law can yeah. do and yeah. what law can't yeah. do, yeah. you know. And you have yeah. to be right. realistic, yeah. I think, about I what law, yeah. even in America today, what it's capable of right. and, and what it's not capable of. It may be able to tweak a few things and get the tenants, you know, in Albany a little break for a little while, but if you think that the real estate industry through the law is not running New York State and America, you know, then, then you're, you're living in a dream world. And, you, and if you think that you can use the law to challenge that, that, that power, again, it's a dream world. Well, they're using the law to try to challenge what happened. They have now, through the, uh, there have been uh, tens of millions of dollars been set in motion to sue right. the state yeah. to try to undo yeah. some they're of the crumbs. limitations yeah. on the... They're, so there we'll crumbs. see, there it's we'll get a good, yeah, that might be a good example to see just how the law works on behalf of, of course, the, mm. the landed uh, uh, classes and so forth. But I think one issue that Michael brings up that's tied to, so we have law, one in the sense of command, obey, or right. domination versus creation, we have constituent constituted, of course, which is fundamental. Right. Then we have a question of, of uh, uh, the form law takes in right. capitalist right. societies right. and its ideological effects right. as well. Right. So, for example, you know, the fact that uh, 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 you, from the standpoint of the law, you exist as an individual. That rights, for example, are only ascribed to individuals. There are no such as group rights, let's say, or community. You know, it, everything is individualized. And when you interact with the state, you interact as this kind of abstracted individual, right? As a legal individual devoid of all content, all, you know, equal in the eyes of the law, as you say. Isn't that really uh, stressing up? You, you're going from the law is connected to individuals, and then now you're saying, like in the current today, where we say the corporation right. is... Law, rights, rights. Abstracted right. individuals. Abstract. Well, well yeah. abstract that doesn't, to, today, yeah. don't we say that the corporation has abstracted rights? We said the corporation's an individual are, now. We said yeah. that. Yeah. 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 So, you know, so if you mix that, if, once you start mixing categories, how can you think clearly anymore? If you're thinking of a corporation as the, as the uh, equivalent of a human being, uh, and then in saying a human being has human rights. We don't say human beings have human rights, right? Because, I mean, I think there's like good work like Agamben has done and stuff on this question of like when you get to the point where you're just in a, mm -hmm. a very bare human, right? Say stateless and, you know, mm -hmm. without citizenship rights. That's exactly when human rights fails you and, and your mere humanity is not enough to guarantee you those rights. Even a few guns. In that moment. Good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, well. But I think that, that question, I thought what you were more saying was around this question of, you know, we have this idea of rights, but they're tied to individuals and they're the same individuals that 
um, you know, through the development of capitalism, came to be regarded as being free individuals who could freely contract and freely sell their labor on the free market and you know and that so that that yeah, concept absolutely. of human rights that is absolutely. opposed absolutely. to empower us is yeah. the same yeah. concept yeah. that kind of is so, that so then you have for example the following dilemmas so you have the academic union correct okay. people it's too risky to let's say occupy the campus or to take over try to do that so then there's there's a thing you know uh uh lobby your politicians in Albany. <laughs> you know, arguing the PSC goes every so months to lobby the people in Albany and as our friend Stanley Ryan was called, you know, collective begging. You know, collective please, begging. <laughs> please, you know, give us, you know, give us... It's gotten worse than collective begging. It's worse than now. It's kneeling for... But then the question is the following. <laughs> Does that work against the political possibilities? Because, you know, it's like what uh, Sartre calls uh, seriality. You know, you, because when you enter, when you interact from the standpoint of you as an abstracted individual who votes or who is able to send a message to their representative informing them of what you would like them to do, are you in effect being disorganized? Is, is, is the capacity of the group to function in a cohesive and collective way being undone by the participation in these political institutions and practices that presuppose you as an abstracted individual. Is what Nikos Polanzas calls the isolation effect of the capitalist state, which is precisely because it treats you as an abstracted, isolated individual. And it tears you apart, let's say, from your... The, the communities in which you might, in fact, be a part of. Yeah, well, it tears you from that. Yeah, what comes to mind is uh, during the impeachment, there were a couple of, uh, you know, um, uh, people in the administration who testified, I, I suppose, against Trump, basically. Yeah. And now, you know, now he's basically, you know, he, he's... he's the he mafia brought, operation. The topic, well, he, he brought the hatchet down on these people. Yeah. When they're out, they were yeah. escorted out yeah. of, the, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, yes. you know, it's like it's sending a signal, in other words, you know, uh, that um, there is, you, you can't, you know, you can't do that. Anybody else who, you know, anybody else who thinks that, you know, they're going to join the students and, and stuff, you know, you, you can kiss your tenure or whatever goodbye, you know. I mean, it sends a message. Um, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Trump sends you a message that yeah. the, ac the academics don't need that message. No, right. academics, already, have, yeah, academics have, have already been conditioned uh, very thoroughly. Well, it's the same thing in Tian <laughs> Tiananmen Square, and it's the same thing at Occupy. You know, it sends a message, you know, if you get too close, you know, too close to, you know, agitating people, uh, you know, the police will come out Maybe. and disperse you. Yeah. But um, sometimes it's out of stupidity, you know, because... Once the cold weather would have hit, you know, the people are not, I mean, the Occupy <laughs> encampments would have kind of disbanded, you know, a bit over know. time. We don't know. Oh, we don't know. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was spreading to warmer climes. It was spreading to warmer climes, so you never know. Well, and then, <laughs> but what's the effect other than it's good publicity for certain ideas? Well, well, the well, effect well, is well. to squelch any uh, effective... No, uh, of the Occupy, uh, of that tactic, let's say, of occupying spaces that aren't necessarily disruptive. So Zuccotti, occupying Zuccotti Park was not disruptive to Wall Street, of course, or downtown Manhattan. Uh, I, I would strongly disagree. I think oh, yeah. that, you know, that was because it had a physical location and it became like a, a hive... <coughs> And, 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 it, and it was beginning to uh, reproduce it itself. It created that possibility Re of a Reproducing group. itself. Well, it, it, yeah. it, the decision was made to cut it off before, you know, the virus spread too far. And, and it already it, spread. I mean, they would, yeah. shut down the port of Oakland. Yeah, yeah, I mean, no, no, but obviously it went to other countries. It was, it was already yeah. in, in yeah. other countries. It was like, a, you know, it's like the, the virus thing, you know. It was spread. really spreading. Yeah. It was really yeah. contagious. Yeah. And yeah, it was ineffective in its in in the current form it had taken, but it had the ability to evolve, to adapt, to become stronger. And the the thought was before it gets, you know, out of control, mm -hmm. it's easy to uh, you know to squelch it. Now, 
and, and that was, uh, it was a decision. But Whether it was an intelligent I mean, decision of, or I mean, not, yeah. I, you know, I don't yeah. know. I mean, I don't think, I mean, part of its effect was the propaganda ideality of the 1%, just, just which made it yeah. possible for Bernie Sanders right. to build a grassroots campaign. Yeah. And had a positive effect in that. In well, that also respect. to just show yeah. that the people yeah. can yeah. come yeah. together yeah. and yeah. have, you know, right. have a political, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you know The Black Lives Matter yeah. movement also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I want, if you don't mind, I want to go back to what you were saying, which I think was really, really interesting really key and what I thought we'd kind of end up talking about here is that if under the law you have rights as an individual only and these are abstract rights then all of our all of the solutions being presented to us especially since Trump especially because I ACLU they're all legalistic um, remedies which we, we're, we're supposed to sue because of immigrants. We're supposed to put this guy in jail because he's corrupt. And they're all individual. And just, so to what extent is that very, very ideological in that it disaggregates us? It, yeah. it's, it's part of capitalist social relations, basically. It's part of the totality, but we don't see it because the ACLU says we should give them money and they're going to fix this stuff. But they can't fix it because we can only fix it if we engage with each other. <laughs> yeah. You know, revolution is not kind of an individual activity. <coughs> right. I, I think, think the ACLU know, are trying for revolution, really. <laughs> You know, right. I mean, like no, that's not they're 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 not, they're not, not, that's really not their not revolution. revolution. No, yeah. no, right. but there right. are, but there are a lot of people on the left that think that that's yeah. a start. Yeah. But, right. but if what you say is true, and if that's what we're talking about, not only is it not a start, is very counterproductive. It's counterproductive. It sets us, it sets us going down a blind alley eventually into a dump where we're. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to like, I agree with your analysis, I mean, your, your diagnosis, um, but I do differ in the sense that I don't think this disempowering effect is a function of, you know, the quote-unquote legalistic politics or judicial politics that the ACLU pursues and more has to do with the fact that, right, like other lobbying, you know, like, you know, based, um, you know, like political groups that may try to engage with legislators, right, is like, you know, the fact that it, there again is more of a clientelistic or just donation based only type of relationship between the organization and the people. Well, um, I think you're talking about the NGOification of politics. Sure, but which is I think this is part of uh -huh. it, right? I mean, I think that's the the larger um, umbrella. Uh, yeah, that's definitely the larger umbrella. I guess I am, in a sense, um, like wondering whether or not it is right to point to again this you know judicial politics as. Um, you know, what is disempowering as opposed to, you know, this kind of like more political disempowerment um, more, more generally. Well, it's, certainly and, it's not the only factor. Uh -huh. And it might not be the most important factor. Mm -hmm. But I think the fact, the, the, the fact that, it, that it obligates you to take the standpoint of, the, of this abstracted individual, you know, to separate yourself from the community is a, a, a key form of uh, uh, disorganization of breaking up those organic bonds that may exist in communities it might be more important of course that the the organic bonds become weaker and weaker because you know the cities become suburbanized or people move to the suburbs or because you have the mediation of of the screens and uh, the cell phones and so forth and you know community becomes weaker and weaker you no longer go to the supermarket you order it online and they ship it to your apartment and so right. forth so yeah, it may not be, yeah, in the I mean it may not be the only factor <laughs> mm -hmm. but I think certainly it's one of one of mm -hmm. the factors that mm -hmm. <coughs> continue to work to disorganize to individualize and to re I mean, continue I, I, reproducing I think, that sure, in, in mean, these relations think, of seriality I think it's yeah, one of the and right. it sets a template right. I think for these right. other and for where, these other where forms. we could go I think with what you're saying is you know, we need greater understanding of the disempowerment of, say, uh -huh. that the ACLU ultimately engages in, you right. know, to always have that active. You know, a great example of this historically is Huey Newton. 
Huey Newton's reputation mm -hmm. was got, gotten because he knew the the civil code so well mm -hmm. that he knew that the police should not get be 86 feet from him, mm -hmm. it should have been 87 and a half feet, and they're violating, violating the civil code. They knew that, but at the same time, they knew they weren't going to get anywhere through, quote unquote, the law in terms of rights, you know, I mean, in, 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 uh -huh. in some way. So, I mean, the Panthers, in a way, are a very good example of this, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons they were destroyed. I mean, nobody went in to destroy the NAACP. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, you know, think about it that way, I think it's, 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 it's an open open question. I'm not, you know, I'm not right. saying you, you deny the ACLU or uh -huh. uh, the Lo Lawyers Guild or something like that. But to understand not only the limitation and, and really always try to think beyond that. And, and, and uh, yeah. It's and, also a practice yeah. question, yeah. I think, like when... Yeah. Yeah. You know, like just to take the ACLU example, yeah. not to yeah. beat that to death, yeah. but, but, you know, I mean, they do their legal practice in a somewhat dislocated way. It's not right. kind of led by those who are most impacted by whatever social issues they're trying to right. address. Right. Um, it's not located in any sort of working class struggle. It's just kind of, right. you know, a smattering of legal cases, which is not to, you know, undermine their work or whatever. You know, there's some value in that, right. Right. but it's not a revolutionary value, at least to my mind anyway. Like, and so what would, you know, but, but that's not to say that you couldn't. Um, you yeah. know, have some mm -hmm. kind of strategy right. that involves you losing legal cases as mm -hmm. part of working class struggle. To but you know, in a way, you have to understand what the limitations are and exactly how you get disorganised. Right. That's right. And kind of come up with strategies to to work against that. And that's the bit where I feel like sometimes movements have kind of like been maybe a bit naive yeah. or kind of have just not like totally done that work to not, sort of go. What are we going uh, to do to actually? you know, use this strategy, but also to then counteract the, the sort of... Right, right. The, to you counteract it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, what one of the things that comes to mind when you were talking is the, the is this, this situation of the, sorry, the poisoning of America, for instance, through mm -hmm. PFOA. And this case has been out there for a long time, but now, um, you know, a major motion picture has been made about Parkersburg, Parkersburg, West Virginia, called Dark Waters. This corporate lawyer has been suing to clean up the water that DuPont poisoned and to get some kind of justice retribution um, for the residents um, for over 25 years. And the case just keeps grinding. That's a legal, I mean, what he should have done was organize those people to organize people who were dependent on DuPont for their livelihoods to shut down the plant? Well, how would, that wouldn't have worked. So the legal method just ends up grinding and grinding and grinding, and he's accomplished absolutely nothing so far. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it turns out we all have PFOA in our bloodstream. Every human in the world does. I mean, I guess I'm just wary of this stance where we look at judicial politics or, you know, kind of like more, more radical extra institutional politics as um, mutually exclusive one or the other type of a situation. I mean, in, in that particular instance, I don't think it should have been the corporate lawyer that, you know, organized anyone. It should have been the people that organized themselves. But then, you know, at that point, I think it would have been possible to also use the, the legal avenue. But then there, even if they have, you know, corporate and they have counsel, it, you know, that legal case would have been brought upon by a movement or a community that was already p politically organized on that basis. And I think it could have also like taken other other means as well and that's why I mean I'm not an ACLU defender like you know by any means but like what if it like you know comes down to things like what was Holder versus um you know the, like that case where the, the Voting Rights Act was you know struck mm -hmm. down in, in the Supreme Court and then I mean is it not possible and of course not just with the ACLU but you know for us as you know communities on and you know movements on the left to have organized and also like you know contributed to you know like the discourse surrounding that Supreme Court decision I don't think like we should rule out like you know using the law as long as again there is popular mobilization yes no of course of course yeah of course, yeah, of course. 
and, and, and it's what and the question is one of antinomies I think is is in the title right. of the course right. because right. it's not mm -hmm. you know there are it's a contradictory process yes. but one has to be conscious and it's not really either or right. I mean, right. an right. antinomy is uh, much more yeah. you know rigorous I mean, could, could you just so find that word for me I looked it up antinomies but it, uh, yeah it had seen you didn't read Kant yet you can't read Hegel you can't come to my classes anymore I can't get a word it's like contradictions yeah contradictions you know because I looked it up in the Google and it had to do with Hutchinson during the, you know, um, the, the faith, British philosopher. No, no, uh, uh, the, um, it was faith versus um, knowledge. Uh, 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 Anne Hutchinson, who oh Anne Hutchinson, Anne Hutchinson you know, during during the um, the early colonial period. Yeah, and well, that's how they define and, and no, no, no. is. No. Okay, so I'll bring I'll bring knew, you the I handle of the, the antinomies of pure reason. Can you give me the short the can, can you give me the short Peter version Peter of the uh, contradiction. Yeah. contradiction? Just a contradiction. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's that's very short. I mean, yeah. one I mean, of the contradictions really is that once you, you get involved, like, yeah. once you bring a lawyer in, it's very demobilizing. Yes. I mean, it does. I think that's one of the contradictions. I I agree with you, but if you just look at Many cases, like the Parkersburg case, mm -hmm. I mean, you bring a lawyer in, and then it's it's his problem. He's going to fix it, you know. And it's hard to maintain a mobile. You know, I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking at the bookshelves, and I have no idea what the titles are. Of books. <laughs> these are these are cases. But, case but, but, case but, but, but the case law. But the yeah. point yeah. of it is, you know, yeah. if you're a lawyer, right? There are book book bookshelf bookshelf after bookshelf after bookshelf of this stuff, and you're going to go to court, and you know. Each party is going to have to refer to these things, and you've got, you know, you've got the best lawyers, and, and you're the little guy, and you're trying, you know, you pick, like Josh, he just picks yeah. up one little book, and he thinks he's going to find some little thing, and, you know, they got a whole slew of the, the top Sometimes they even have their own, they have their own language, you know, by default. Sometimes they even have their own <laughs> literal language, that the language of the state is distinct from the language yeah. of the common people, yeah. and yeah. there's no way to know even what that is. So like me and a physicist arguing about, you know, the Big Bang Theory, you know, it's yeah. like, it's, you know, who's going to win every argument? But you know, when you were saying, like, you bring the lawyer in, I mean, <laughs> so I'm a lawyer. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it depends what lawyer you bring in, right? Like, and how you do it. And, like, one of the challenges we have is that, you know, lawyers who do work with movements, which is the kind of work that I do with organisers and folks who are in, you know, struggle, like, you know, we have this understanding of the professional, right? So there's, like, this professionalisation of, of this particular occupation. That has, you know, and it's it's had it on its own interest in making itself thoroughly inaccessible, right? And there was a time when you paid by the word, right? So lawyers wrote in very, you know, flourish language, and you know, there's like if over the course of the development of the industry, it's entirely self-regulated, right? Yeah. They license themselves and regulate themselves, and they have their own rules of ethics, and those rules of ethics, are like when you read them, they're entirely designed to serve corporate interests and not designed mm -hmm. to serve, you know, people and you know, individuals and so forth, working people. So, you know, it, it's like very true, right? And at the same time, you know, lawyers could, all, in the same way that we're saying the law could be a tool, you know, if you could use it strategically and it's all about, you know, how you manage, you know, how you don't fall into the trap of having to manage the contradictions because we could never do that. Um, similarly, the lawyers are the same, I think, in a certain sense. Like, they, you know, like that lawyer could, you know, had they been a different person and not try, you know, like, not just try to go that go it alone. Yeah. And understood, you know, yeah. how the what they were trying to do fit into the popular struggle yeah. and so forth. Maybe it would have been different. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it's kinda of interesting. You know, no, I don't disagree with anything. I it's just totally what it yeah. is, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I completely agree with what you know what you said about the challenges posed by these more technical aspects of legal cases and what that then means for even um, you know the movements that are trying to work you know by these through these legal means. Um, I feel like there is no way around it though, in the sense that. Um, you know, like it can feel good for like us all to go out on the streets and like, you know, like to like demand things and, you know, to try to like, you know, occupy the building of a university president and, and whatnot. But, you know, ultimately, like I feel like us even as movement need 
a, a more concrete and better sense of like what we want and how we want to change things, you know, fit into the larger picture. And then in order to do that, then we do need um, more maybe technical appreciation of, you know, how things fit together. And, and I think maybe on that note, then what needs to happen is not to um, to avoid, uh, you know, legal confrontations entirely, but to, um, you know, devote more energy and resources to political education, um, you know, within movements as, as well. Yeah, sure. And it's also the job of, yeah. you know, movement yeah. lawyers yeah. to democratize the law, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. to actually yeah. actively do that mm-hmm. work. And that's one of the things we don't have a lot of, right? Yeah, yeah. I would never even would have thought of that. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they don't do that. No, we don't no. do that. Yeah. So lawyers, even like, so we say good lawyers, like, you know, labor lawyers and whatever, you know, don't spend a lot of time working on actually getting to a place where they're no longer needed. Right, right. Right, right. like where the people can actually yeah. fight back themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think to add one fourth problem, let's say, because we have uh, Commander Bay versus the thing, constituent versus constituted, the ideological effect of, uh, of law, the fact that we take the standpoint of a abstracted legal subject mm-hmm. and how this, of course, uh, transforms in some ways the political range of possibilities. We also have the question of law as a, a, a system of rules that maintains certain constitutive categories mm-hmm. wow. that we understand the world through, public and private, for example. You know, we are, contemporary societies are uh, unique or particular in the way they understand themselves as containing these public and private spheres. Uh, if you go back to the ancients, for example, there was no such a thing, of the understanding of uh, the contemporary way of understanding public and private as a matter of interests. Right. Mm-hmm. As a matter of interests. There were spatial distinctions made on certain things or functional distinctions, but to say, because, I mean, paradoxically, you know, the thing that, let's say, is least common is presented as that which binds people together in contemporary societies, interests. That there is such a thing as a national interest, let's say, or a common interest, as opposed to particular interests. And there is a... And the law is, of course, key in maintaining those distinctions. We know from, of course, from the Jewish question onwards, you know, we have the, the Marxist analysis of these right. things. We have Paul Kahnes and uh, his theory of Marxism and law, which is something I think we should, one of the things we, we'll probably be reading, you know, the next month or so. But I think this is also a distinction. So you have, let's, going back to our friend Trump, you know, people saying Trump is corrupt because instead of defending national interests, he was putting his own, the particular interest before the national interest. And how do you know what the national interest is? You know, there's all kinds of problems. And, and on some levels, they have a point, the, the Republican defenders of Trump, because how do you know what his intention is? How can you know? Is almost an impossibility. You know, when they talk about transparency, we want transparency. It's a very loaded uh, idea because you can have transparency when it comes to process or you can have transparency when it comes to implementation. When the rule comes down and it says the fine for parking is X, if the the traffic person does not give you that ticket, you can have transparency and say, look, here you have a corruption because they were friends or they, because they were from the same village because there was a John Jay sticker on the window. All my colleagues... Police, judge, police benevolence. Apparently, you know, my friends at John Jay said, oh, I don't have a car, luckily. But they said, yeah, but John Jay stickers, you don't get tickets. There are all kinds of things. There you can have transparency. But when it comes to not bureaucratic corruption, what we could call bureaucratic corruption, which is how true to the rule you are in the implementation, but to the creation of the laws or the rules, how can there be transparency? How can you know what goes on inside the head of the legislator? Are they doing it because of that campaign contribution someone gave them? That's why there's this law about quid pro quo. 
<coughs> because otherwise it's impossible to know. You cannot look into... Now, de facto, de facto we know that it is, of course, a given that whoever, you know, the fact that Trump has certain kinds of commercial interests, that they, the certain kinds of friendships and family relations and so forth, that impacts on the, on the conduct. But it's impossible to have transparency on that, you know? It's an, and there is a whole set of legal rules that underpin this position. So, if Trump makes a phone call from the private residence within the White House for campaign contributions, this is perfectly legal and fine. If he would make it from the Oval Office, it is a violation right. because it is a public to private transaction as opposed to private to private. So we have here then law mm -hmm. performs a function the same as, let's say, law in Leviticus performs a function, which is to maintain the purity of the categories mm -hmm. of the existing society. You know, why you cannot eat the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the lobsters or the crabs because we have the category of sea life, which is fish with scales that swim. Something that is in the sea that doesn't fit that definition is out of place. It is a corruption. It has to be eliminated for the sake of maintaining the purity of the idea. You know, I have an idea as, as you talk about this. One, one thing as a reader that might be very interesting is to read Foucault's preface to transgression, you know, which is very interesting where he says the law is already there, right. you know, in a way that Bataille on transgression really isn't that radical in a sense, because the law is already, as I think you're pointing out here. I think it would be an interesting, you know, even though it's not, quote, within, no, you know, left legalism, it could be interesting given what you're saying right yeah. now under your, you know, your fourth category. Yeah. What do you mean by the law is already there? Well, that you're not really transgressing anything. You're, it's already anticipated your transgression. It's already in the content of the law. Right. That they can work with it. The word Peter's talk, talking about if you eat a certain kind of lobster, you know, Leviticus, there's already a, a law ready for you, you know, that says, oh, you think you're being transgressive, but, you know, there's. Yeah, or more to the point, yeah, the ahead. problem is not if Trump would make the phone call from downstairs or upstairs. Right, right, exactly. it's, it's maintaining these rules and rituals no. that reproduce Deuce, right. these categories Absolutely. through which we understand Constantly. which constitute our contemporary world. Yes. And to transform the, the society, you have to break those categories. Right. They right. have to be destroyed. Right. And, and, you're not, and you don't right. destroy them by reinforcing them, by repeating... Right. The legal, right. the so you're going to go to jail on one, one afternoon for a protest and resistance. That's not doing anything, really. You know, ultimately, that's already anticipated. You know, this is maybe one of the failings of protest and resistance. You know, as long as you maintain the bourgeois, let's say, distinction between the public and the private. Right. You know, the uh, uh, the normal, the pathological, let's say, when it comes to contemporary politics, then. You are, I mean, there are things that are possible to do in that context, but one thing you cannot do, of course, is transgress the liberal political order. Right, right. And I think, without I think breaking, right, so without I breaking have a those question that, that, I mean, you, yeah. can, you can have free universities, you can have health care, you can have more or less civil rights and so forth, but you can't break the dominant form of the, right. the uh, politics that exist. No, just uh, because we have a lawyer in the room, or just about like the. Oh Catholic boy, you shouldn't have said it. <laughs> you shouldn't have said it. Yeah, no, no. Now you become the central. We might be back next week. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how relevant this is anyway, but the categories, you know, in other words, uh, is it, they, it seems to be a, a category in law that there's activities, and then there is intent within the mind, you know, right. and it's it's like you know, say Trump or any other issue, you know. It, if he does something that's an activity that's uh, it's quantifiable, it's observable, it's you know you can record it. And it's one thing, and then it, it either went outside the category or the boundaries or not. But when it comes to the interior, to the intent, what's going on in the mind, right? Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, other than to say that's a category of which the law doesn't really have much in a way to to deal with. In other words, 
I may have the intent to commit murder or to exploit my workers, but you can't take me to court, right? No, they can't. In can. any way. They can't. Mm. Uh, well, perhaps if you want to murder someone murder, yeah. and they catch you well, before you yeah. murder them, doesn't mean well you okay. can't do anything. Right. Like that. But what about yeah. like if I might, you know, I well, I, I, run, I run a business and my intent is to you know uh, maximize the exploitation of my workers. That's perfectly legal. That's, well, legal. Like yeah, that's, what, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but if, it, it, but if, if you're trying to defraud <laughs> so people, got a in the law. <laughs> if you intend to defraud, yeah, but you could never write a law that's you know a, a new law and say going henceforth. You know, it's against the law to have the intent. But would we want to? to? I mean, you know, <laughs> no, think about all the things I thought of doing and there haven't done. Be a law. <laughs> well, like the example I gave with Trump and the Ukraine, for example. Yes. Now, if corruption, if political corruption means that you use public uh, uh, your public office for private gain, you have to have some idea of what the intent was. What was the intention, as he says, well, I'm simply trying to eliminate corruption in the Ukraine, or I'm simply trying to, you know, or not. Well, you can't, I mean, you could deduce from what happens certain things, yeah. but it's not a direct quid pro quo. There was the only time. That's what I'm saying. There is no law in the world against political corruption. There's no such thing. Right, right. There doesn't exist. What exists are laws against certain things that could be called corruption, nepotism bribery, these kinds of things. There was one attempt in New South Wales in Australia in the, the 90s to have a law that said, that was general in the generic sense that, it, okay, if you use your office for uh, a private gain, it, it is a crime. And they deposed the premier of New South Wales. I, I don't know if he went to jail, but they changed the law afterwards. Because what happened? He appointed someone in the parliament to a cabinet position, to a ministry. And then that seat went to someone in his party so they would get the majority. So the judge says, obviously you did that not for the good of New South Wales, but for the good of your party. And that violates the law. That's a corruption. And it's a very interesting trial because, of course, the argument is, well, if you make that a corruption, all of... Contemporary plots was a corruption right, because, right, but. you know, because if, <laughs> let's say, you know, Cuomo mm -hmm. decides to give uh, 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 CUNY more money, they can say, you're giving them more money because, it, 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 because you want them to vote for you. You see what I mean? Right. It's not because you have come up with an objective or determination. You'll, you'll this is the best possible thing for the community, right, right. but you're trying to shore up right. support for your electoral right. activities or what have you. Right. That's why you gave the money. Now you go to jail for being corrupt. Right. All of contemporary politics are about, as it's in, in, in this form, hmm. is about the clash of private interests, let's say. But we still maintain, in a very fetishistic way, the notion of the public good or the public interest. And again, you have all these reproducing that fetishized understanding of well, this the goes on world. from the nation as a, everywhere uh, everywhere know, as but uh, even uh, even uh, those uh, who uh, should know better yes, now absolutely. the arguments that oh, Donald on. Trump he's yeah. a criminal he's just in it for himself right. you know he should have sent the arms to the mm. Ukraine or whatever the case may be he's jeopardizing right. American right. national interests yes. yeah. mm. so get, get president Putin on the phone mm. yeah, yeah. Just to go back to one thing that was said earlier about the civil disobedience and, you know, it, it being already anticipated by the law, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't challenge the categories. I mean, I think just a small thing really is just that, and, and the same way Occupy it was maybe not challenging legal yeah. categories as such. Mm -hmm. It was challenging pro property in a certain sense, yes. and, yeah. you know, public space, you know, what regulates public space. But, but I still think there's, you know... Like, just because they don't do those things doesn't mean they're not doing anything, right? And so it's important to sort of recognise the extent to which we might be doing certain strategic activities that are not necessarily challenging the law or, you know, the categories that it, it you know, reproduces, but maybe are building in other ways that will, you know, we'll be able to use later on mm -hmm. um, strategically, right? So, you know, like I would always sort of push for civil disobedience, you know, even though it doesn't, you know, like... No, no, yeah, no, you know, even no. though it doesn't exactly... I mean, Foucault's thing. essay is really about yeah, sexual transgression mm -hmm. as well, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. sexual, political... So <laughs> for me, a way of, like, yeah. framing or, like, the, the frame within which, like, I'm, I've been thinking about 
what you just said is I completely agree with the need to um, overcome the liberal political order. Um, but like the, the question that rises for me then is if we agree, um, and, and I think we will, that there definitely is a dimension to the law that is tied to a democratic self-determination of a political community, what does then I don't, I mean, it's like, who knows what a post-capitalist order, you know, might look like, but what does a post- More capitalism on right now. <laughs> I mean, but like, what does a post-capitalist <laughs> political community look like vis-a-vis -vis something like a legal system? Right. Is there room for a, a legal system? And I think like that gets us to like, you know, the question of um, system differentiation in modern societies. Is yeah. that something that we overcome? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's still plausible, and, and I agree with a lot of people in eco-socialists that, you know, um, argue for steady-state economy, um, right, that, you know, we no can't... No growth. Right, yeah. um, no. that we, we can't yeah, have right. that, and, and, and in that sense, um, right, like, like the, the sheer complication of transactions, you know, might, you know, come down a, a level, but I don't think there still would be no need for um, some forms of adjudication and rule... Um, both like determination and like abiding yeah. by by them, and then so what what does what might that look like? And the other side of and this is also why I talked about agonism or conflict as potentially also being on the side of um, uh, a power making the constitutive side is that um, I don't think that a post capitalist society will be conflict free, right? Yeah. Um, you know we're not like going to all of a sudden enter this like you know but communion with one another. But yeah. like here one uh, difference is. Whereas contemporary society asserts that what is common uh -huh. to us are a set of interests. Right. In this case, it will not be this abstracted set of interests that right. you know. Right. There's right. nowhere to be found. It would. What is common is that we live together. Let's say in this mm -hmm. space, or that we share a certain geographical space, and we want to have clean water and clean air and many other things too. Mm -hmm. So what is common is that we live together, or something else can be common. But for sure, it would not be that what is common or a set of interests. But that, that only gets at like a shift in the substance of the law and not in the form of the law. My question is, does it like you know do anything to, in a sense, like the form and the, the legal system as such? And I don't even know how to begin to interrogate that. Um, so well, another thing. I mean, we could also. I mean, I'm just going mm -hmm. through books in my head yeah. here. In that sense. But you know, another thing we could maybe look at is uh, Jameson's piece on what utopia would look mm -hmm. like in terms of the army mm -hmm. being the regulator. American uh, utopia. American utopia. I'm not familiar with <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. I mean, you know, just uh -huh. what you're saying. Yeah, what is it an essay or a, a it's, book? It's a yeah. book. Uh, it was an essay. It was actually a conversation yeah. with uh, Aronowitz uh, that uh, we helped sponsor uh, years mm -hmm. ago, and uh, it was turned into an essay and then a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a controversy, wasn't it? It was oh. a controversy. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, guess what it is? I said, oh, I guess we're ready for the army. How'd you guess? I, mean, I said, you set me up. Yeah, I just said, the army, <laughs> everyone would become members of the army. Yeah. Yeah. You believe that? Housing question. The housing question. Medical yeah. care. You don't belong here. You I don't think there. it was meant to be taken literally. Yeah. Yeah. Not literally. Yeah. Not literally. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting model. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, in some ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Who enforces? Wow. Yes. Where is the enforcement of the law? The enforcement of the new form of law. And then, of course, you have the pretext of the earlier Constitution mm -hmm. to study the USSR, which was a quite an original document, you mm -hmm. know, the 1917 yeah. Constitution. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting because mm -hmm. they really wanted to go. It was the first time anybody, you know, read beyond bourgeois law. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So to, to go into that model, too. And, yeah. and there are always, it's yeah. not that as if, yeah, you know, right. you ever have a society right. without right. certain limitations. Yes, of course. You know, by definition, democracy has no limitations right, right, per se. Right. So you can be overcome, yes. but always in any given moment, there is a kind of parameter of yeah, what is, yeah. you know, what, what the norms are and what, and what the rules are yeah. and, and so forth. Uh, but yeah, it takes, I mean, mm -hmm. I think for one, we wouldn't have, uh, uh, it wouldn't be this fetishized law of mm -hmm. abstracted individuals right, right, with rights, right, yeah. of course. Right. It would have to be something more concrete, more real, mm -hmm. but that might be. I mean, we have we have pre-capitalist examples, you know. But what and that might, you know, they might serve as some kind of inspiration as to what 
some things might look at, but yeah. we don't have any yeah. post capital. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, that's what there is. Build a hospital in six days. No, but some things, <laughs> like we had the other day, the discussion of the police. Right. You know, right. it is a, a uniquely contemporary fetishistic right. understanding right. that someone can be concurrently a servant of the state and the citizen at the same time. Mm -hmm. yes. And that citizens can be police mm -hmm. and that's not a problem politically. Right. Mm -hmm. Because in, in Athenian democracy, mm -hmm. of course, citizens could not be police. Mm -hmm. Only right. slaves were allowed right. to be so police. Jameson because that would not negate the, the principles of mm -hmm. equality, right. Right. You, know, and the, you know, the equality of, 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 uh, of citizens. Right. It was a substantive equality. It wasn't a formal equality mm -hmm. that in the eyes of the law, you're all the same. You know, that in 275 gets you a ride on the subway. You know, it was a substantive equality that we all are equal. But you know? And if I have a gun and I can put you in handcuffs, we're not equals. Mm, right. And it's also a way of, of course, of guarding against p potential excesses of the police because now they are nominal inferiors being overseen by, by citizens. So, you know, there, there's a check on potential violations of police powers, which now, of course, are, is, there's, the, the, nominally, there are some things, like you have, of course, community boards and so forth, but in, in effect, it doesn't work. Whereas if they were non-citizens, it would be much, you, it would be much more uh, easy to regulate and maintain you know, a certain kind of decorum. And, of course, because, you know, you have this, you have when it comes to the subjective qualities, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the subjective qualities you want in a citizen, presumably, is the capacity to lead and to be led in turn. Mm -hmm. right? Citizens take turns. Mm -hmm. Police, you don't want them leading. You want them only to be servile, to take orders. So that's a different kind of personality, different kind of person that, that you want to have. Fine. I'll give you a call later to see how he's doing. Thank you. Thanks. So do you, um, I, I, sorry, I haven't attended any of your classes before. Do you send, like, send links to the readings? Yes. Or, yeah. wanna, what, what we can do yeah. is we can discuss what we want to read next. This is, this is the Meister at this. Oh, he, he really, he's really good at this. <laughs> yeah. And we have connections to the Russians. That, oh, uh, right. We can get almost <laughs> anything. We have everything, yeah. So one idea is we could do maybe um, for next week, Yeah. we could maybe do something on the... Uh, on uh, 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 ideology and public private and isolation, mm -hmm. which would be maybe we could read Marx on the Jewish question, which is pretty It's a great starting point, I think, because be it fundamentally sets up, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, and the then we can read this down. In yeah. concurrent to that, uh, from political and power and social classes, the section on the isolation mm -hmm. effect mm -hmm. on law and this, this organization of the working mm -hmm. class so, uh, that might be so useful. Okay. Yeah. You know, like, and yeah. then we can also yeah. include yeah. as part of that yeah. it is uh, they're all not that long mm -hmm. uh, from the critique of dialectical reason on the, seriality, seriality. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. which is Sartre's late, late work um, you know when he mm -hmm. actually went full circle <laughs> around to giving up his bourgeois individual past <laughs> through existentialism <laughs> to Marxist existentialism or existential Marxism. That sounds great. Because it seems yeah. that's one of the, yeah, one yeah, of, that's yeah, one of the issues yeah, most yeah, people yeah. are interested What's in. The, mm -hmm. I would love to read. Uh, but we're plans to, which political one are you referring to? This classes. political oh, yeah. power? We have that. We have it. Yeah, we have it already. From the democracy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, great section too. Who actually was wrote a piece on law, right? His Remember? dissertation was on Marxism and Marxism law. Marxism and law. Mm -hmm. Actually, let me look at with, that. Cause with Sartre, the, there may be some good things in there, right? I mean, he, he initially Sartre. was an yeah. existential Marxist. Yes, exactly. He was an editor at Le Temps Modern. Right, yeah. They're all, and there are all kinds of uh, the first scandalous be, rumors, uh, of in course, because he was, he was <laughs> dating at that time uh, some of the uh, mm. daughter. <laughs> what daughter? He has an adopted daughter. The adopted daughter? daughter? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyway, but at that point, but I, much later I read some of the stuff and then I realized where he got the ideas from. Yeah. Because 
It's not Althusserian, this I give the isolation effect. No, I mean, it's no. not really. Some, I mean, it's a very Althusserian book. From Sartre, it's pretty oh. And Massive that work. Yeah. seems like one of his original contributions. But then when you read Sartre on seriality, <laughs> then it's obvious right. where he got, yeah. you know, <laughs> he got the idea. Next year, Josh, so we're going to do the critique. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> okay. yeah. But he was very influenced by it. Sartre. Yeah. And phenomenology. When he went to, he got to France, he, uh, he was in Merleau Ponty's uh, seminar. Yeah, yeah. That was his first. Uh, who was uh, Who is the guy that wrote the song about Poulain's uh, suicide? Is a song. He wrote. There's a song. Yeah, yeah he, you know he, that rec song? he recently died. What was it? What was the name of that song? Uh, I was trying to think of that the other day. Thanos Mikrutsikos is the guy's name. Yeah, he I died a, a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. um, That's too bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know you have it on. I have, I have the, I have the yeah. song, yeah. So okay. I was trying to look for it on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in on the Jewish question, do you want us to, to focus largely on the difference between political and human emancipation, or are there other paths? Because I don't think it's an easy piece. Like, is, is, it's not an easy piece, no. It's yeah. A, and, you know, some people find it very anti-quote Semitic. Yeah. So, Part two. Yeah. Part two. Years ago, when I was teaching at City yeah, College, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very I ran so. into a, a, a Marshall Berman song, and right. he said, uh, what are you teaching? I said, I'm doing the Jewish question this week. <laughs> which part? I said, what do you mean, which part? Right, but in my part, yeah. <laughs> Andre Glucksmann. You do the whole thing? Andre Glucksmann, who was a the whole thing, like, or, just, came, uh, or just the first part? Yeah. I said, well, just do the yeah, first yeah. part. Oh. He said, no matter how much academic perfume you spread on it, it's still anti-Semitic. I don't That's agree with that. I don't agree either, but so that, that was the model out there. Part one. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, part one. But yeah. is the distinction between state and civil society, political rights and, and, right. and human no, rights, okay. or state and civil society, society. and and the fetishistic nature right. of that distinction, right. I think, is really key. Mm -hmm. You know, the fetishistic nature that you have this divorce of the actual and the abstract. Because, you know, one of Marx's points is all we have is civil society in a sense, right? All our, 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 our activity is in the domain of civil society. And then we have this fetishistic level of the uh, 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 political, which exists only in that abstracted sense, and the whole point of for emancipation, he says, is to bring these things together. Mm -hmm. right? Even the law is divided to, in the same right, way. To bring, right, to bring into our real uh, 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 existence politics, as opposed to have it separated away through this, this mm -hmm. fetishist legal framework. Are you, legal you a framework. professor? Uh, you, you teach? Or? No, no? I, uh, I do branding in fashion. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. You are enterprise, in other words. Right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Hopefully not. Maybe an issue. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, that's so good to know. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So you'll send that out to us. And you I will, yeah. So we'll be, yeah, right. I can send it an email. Thank and I'll you. put it on yeah. the website. And we put everything on the website, so you oh, can just... Yeah, just go to the yeah. website. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Okay. And plus, if Seriously. you want to review the YouTube videos, right. come up uh, mm -hmm. usually a few days yeah. after the class. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll do that. We have Marx, Poulanzas, and Sartre. That's a good... That's a good yeah. starting yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Heavy, heavy, heavy weights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. I'll leave Jack Johnson and Mike Tyson.